This was my first visit to Croatia and Greece. I caught a light rail train from Seattle to the airport where I showed proof of my COVID vaccination and swapped my cloth mask for a blue surgical mask to board the Lufthansa flights, first to Frankfurt, then to Zagreb, Croatia. It was an uneventful 11-hour flight to Frankfurt where we had a real meal of penne pasta and salad. The first 18 days in Croatia, I visited Lake Plivitz National Park, Novalia, Sibenik, Split, and Dubrovnik. In Dubrovnik, I had to change my plans to travel to Greece by bus through Albania and North Macedonia since international buses had canceled routes for lack of passengers. With no direct flights to Athens, I took flights that went to Madrid, London, and finally Athens. Lots of COVID paperwork. Airports were virtually empty, as were the planes. After clearing Athens immigration and health, I took the metro to the Monastiraki Square Station about a 40-minute ride just two blocks from my safe stay hostel. I would often have meals at these restaurants surrounding Monastraki Square where there were performers, protests, and crowds, often late into the night. The safe stay hostel was clean and pleasant with lots of amenities. The best was the rooftop bar with a fabulous view of the Acropolis complex with half-price happy hour drinks. After a short stay in Athens, I took the half-hour metro ride to the Piraeus Piers, where I bought a ticket on the Blue Star Ferry to Syros. It was a comfortable three and a half hour ride. These ferries are amazing on how much vehicle traffic and passenger traffic they hold, and what comfortable seating there are, both inside and on the open decks. Again, there continued to be few passengers aboard, and this was on June 27th. When the ferry arrives at the Ermupoli Harbor, it does a U-turn and quickly backs into the wharf where cars and people dislodge. I sped up the arrival of another ferry boat with its U-turn landing. I had lunch at one of the wharfside restaurants and explored the harbor that was filled with laundered Cayman Island or drug money super yachts. The show of wealth in these big boats is astounding on how their wealth is flaunted. Some of the bigger boats are owned by Russian oligarchs. The town of Ermupoli has streets and walkway stairs that take you to the top where the church Anno Siros looks down upon the whitewashed town. On the way up, I passed by the elegant city hall. It was then on to the Agios Nikolaos Church with its beautiful interior. The Greek Orthodox Anastasios Church dominates the hilltop, dating back to 1873 with its Byzantine and neoclassical designs. I then headed back down to the wharf area where I took the hourly bus to Galicis. Here I found a beautiful shallow sandy beach area filled with sunbeds, umbrellas, and few tourists.
I stayed at the Peter and Tony guest house where Tony introduced me to his wife, Christiana, who was from Vancouver, BC. They also had an elementary boy and girl that hung out a lot at the bistro and shops below the rooms. I enjoyed my three days of relaxation before reboarding the bus back to Vermoopoli and enjoyed the stops along the way to other beaches on this fairly desolate, rock-filled island. Just like clockwork, the Blue Star Ferry came into port and did its about phase to disgorge the vehicles and people before we boarded the ferry to Mykonos for the 40 minute journey. We arrived at the new port of Mykonos, which was a couple miles north of the whitewashed town of Mykonos, and they had a sea bus ferry that took me to the central part of the village. In Mykonos, they even painted the grout around the stepping stones white. Most of the doors, shutters, and railings were painted blue, as well as some other parts of the buildings like domes. Apparently, white and blue paints symbolized patriotism. Compared to times before COVID, there were few tourists walking about. The restaurants that skirted the promenade were peopled by many wealthy and several models. Throughout the village, I saw professional photographers having some of the models pose in this beautiful setting. There were a cluster of six windmills left over from the days of milling grain into flour. Some of the tourist postcards show these windmills with white sails, but now they're gone or have just have some remnants of the sails left below. Throughout the village, there were other windmills that were missing the spokes of the windmills as well. After lunch, I caught the bus that runs hourly to the Paraga Beach Hostel, where I was staying for three nights. It was just about four kilometers from down. The narrow one-lane road had frequent turnouts as we wove our way along the rock-lined road. Of the 1,000 accommodations at the Paraga Beach Hostel, there are only 70 people here. My dorm had no AC, so it was like a sweat box in the 100 degree weather. The bay was beautiful, along with a small but pleasant pool. If there were 1,000 people here, like pre-COVID, it would have been party central. The staff here was very pleasant and helpful, and they kept the place immaculate. This place was like a ghost town with only 70 guests. Other resorts in the area, like the Paradise Beach Club, was also like a ghost town. When I returned to the village of Mykonos, I took a boat ride out to Delos Island. Delos Island was the mythical birthplace of twins Apollo and Artemis and is one of the most important archaeological sites in Greece. The Terrace of Lions once had 16 lions and now these five replicas symbolize how the Noxo people honored Apollo's birthplace. The sacred Lake is out that way.
some of the mosaic tile on the floor remain today. In 1478 BC, it established a treasury here during its alliance with Athens. The Romans made it a duty-free port, which increased its importance, and they managed a slave market that sold up to 10,000 people a day. As other places became trading centers, Delos declined and was a small settlement for Christians and was a hideout for pirates who also plundered some of the antiquities. Greece is restoring the large pavilion, but it's slow going. On Saturday, July 3rd, I took the ferry to Santorini, my third Greek island. Once again, there were few passengers on this three-hour ferry ride compared to pre-COVID times. We stopped at Paro Island to discharge and take on people and cars. white top cliffs of Santorini come into view. The sea jet ferry ride as we approached the wharf was unreal. The cliffs were about a thousand feet high, topped with a thick layer of white rocks and cities glistening in white. Etched into this cliff was an impossible switchback road descending to our wharf. As we disembarked, I spotted the buses lined up with the green accents and boarded for Fira. Many others dithered around and ended up taking taxis for the shuttle buses. I buckled up, and as we started up these switchbacks, I realized that if the bus went over, no one sur would survive the fall, buckled up or not. This was the most beautiful island I have been to, with white painted hotels, restaurants, and stores clustered together and draped down impossibly on the steep caldera walls. While here, I took the 10 mile or so trail along the ridge tops and passed a number of villages and resorts with their many individual infinity pools that were mostly empty on my way to Oya at the northern tip of the island. Along the way, there were also two small churches that provided solace to other travelers now and in the past. From this chapel, it was all downhill to Oya. Oya village is built on the volcano caldera and was mostly destroyed by an earthquake in 1956. It has been rebuilt and it has become a real draw to tourists with its high-end shops, hotels, and restaurants. The Lonely Planet Guide says that Oya is often overcrowded with the cruise line crowds but because of COVID restrictions, the crowds were thin, which made it a pleasant experience for me. These two blue dome churches are probably the most photographed buildings in Greece. I caught the sunset against the white village with its hotels, restaurants, gift shops, and blue dome churches that draped down the caldera edge. The clapping at sunset is a long tradition here. 
I took an all-day tour of the island for 35 euros. Our guide took the 12 of us to several spots which included a monastery, Santos Winery, with a view down the ferry wharf, a lighthouse, the Red Beach, the Black Beach in Paresa, where we stayed for lunch and swimming for about two and a half hours, and then we ended up with another sunset at Oya. Okay, monastery near Pygros. The grapevines are grown low to the ground to protect the fruit from the harsh winds and sun by covering the fruit with the leaves. was another whitewashed village that ran down to the wide black beach that had some people sunning under beach umbrellas and sunbeds. The beach consisted of volcanic black small gravel and the slope was gentle as were the waves when we were there. You can see that there are still very few people here. We returned to Fira at the end of the tour and I enjoyed a sunset dinner of pork chops overlooking Fira and the sea and the islands below. Here, you could either take the cable car down to the beach from the caldera's edge or ride these mules. Both were popular with the cruise crowd. The mules were pretty idle with the lack of tour cruise boats. The White Door Theater featured the My Fat Greek Wedding. symbolizes exuberance or joy, and the smashing of plates at a wedding symbolizes a new beginning for the newlyweds, followed by shouts of Opa. another white knuckle ride down the edge of the caldera to get to my ferry boat to Crete Island.
The ferry arrived three hours late, and buses to the hostel I planned to stay at in Plaquias stopped running for the day. So I stayed in Heraklion at the Lonely Planet recommended So Young Hostel, along with two other travelers who were my bunkmates from the Fira Backpackers Hostel on Santorini Island. dinner near the port at this streetside restaurant. The following day I visited the Heraklion Archaeological Museum, followed by a bus ride to the Palace of Gnosis. This visit showed me how the Minoans had dominated southern Europe more than 4,000 years ago. The Palace of Gnosis was an amazing walk through a civilization that flourished 4,000 years ago. The archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans from 1900 to 1930 recreated some of the frescoes and pillars which was met with mixed reviews as he supervised the restoration. It makes me wonder what our American civilization will be like 4,000 years from now. Bull fresco represents power and light. Propyleum is a term for a grand entrance to a temple. There are a number of theories about the sacred horn used for sighting celestial objects, honoring bulls, representation of the moon. Pithoi means large pots. The lustral basin may have been a place where visitors purified themselves upon entering the temple grounds. The archeologist Evans portrayed this replica in his vision. Some say it's a prince, a boxer, a woman bull jumper. Who knows? The throne room mystery is that it may have been a council chambers, or for a king, or for a priestess. This staircase descends four floors containing rooms and apartments. The light wells and design are considered a miracle of architecture at the time. I enjoyed the soothing sound of this fountain while dining. I marveled at the clean streets and sidewalks everywhere in Greece. The following day, I took a morning bus to Rathano, which featured a huge fortress built in the 15th century and topped with a mosque. In 1647, this fort was overrun by the Turks, and that was when the mosque was built. What stage?
This mosque was a Venetian church dedicated to St. Nicholas in 1580, but it became a mosque after the Ottomans invaded the city in 1646. The mosque was named after the leader of the Ottoman invasion, Sultan Ibrahim. This small Orthodox church was built in the 19th century. After visiting the fort, I headed down to the old village to the Lagia area, which comprised of narrow walkways filled with flowers, shops, restaurants, before returning to Heraclio. This was another Venetian church that was converted in 1657 to a mosque following the Ottoman invasion of 1646. Then, when Crete was free of Turk rule in 1898, it became an Orthodox church, but now it's a music conservatory. It was a three-hour morning bus ride along the coast from Heraclio to Chania. I had booked two nights at the Cocoon City Hostel since it was star rated by Lonely Planet. It cost 20 euros per night. It was stunning with large gathering areas including one around an outdoor soaking pool. I ran into Nomadic Matt, a popular blogger from Austin who I have followed for years. It was clean and the staff was great. There were two high-end kitchens. They also offer breakfast and barista coffee in the mornings. Here are a couple gathering areas along with the pool. The bathrooms had beautiful green frosted glass partitions and black and white tiles. The toilet areas included bidets. The dorms have individual lights and power plugs at each bed and lockers below the bunks. I then walked a short distance to the Venetian harbor lined with outdoor restaurants, glass bottom boats, horse and buggy rides and the remains of a fort. This gypsy girl was playing her drum for donations while her parents rested in the shade of the mosque. Her little brother spelled her off some. She seemed to be in pretty good spirits though. Like most cities, this was the Chania public market where goods and foods were abundant. The Venetians built this fortress around 1629 for protection against the Ottomans.
morning, our bus arrived on the twisty, narrow road to the Samaria Gorge National Park at an elevation of 4,035 feet. From there, it was about a 10-mile hike down to sea level. The start of the hike was pretty crowded as we all worked our way down two miles of stone stairways. Eva from Poland, who had been my seatmate on the bus, became my hiking buddy. At one of the early viewpoints, a woman asked for me to take her picture. After I did, Eva and I noticed that she traveled at the same pace as us and then joined us for the remainder of the hike down the gorge. Her name is Iwana from Romania, and it turned out that this was her way of celebrating her birthday. So the bottom of the gorge. When we got to the Samaria gorge floor, we finally saw water running along the bottom of the gorge. Samaria Village was abandoned in 1962 when this area became a park. The villagers were mostly beekeepers and loggers. It is at the halfway mark on the trail and has spring water and bathroom facilities which provides a good resting point for hikers. Here are my two hiking buddies posing on the bridge to the village. We tanked up on this spring water. Good. Me too. We're going to get some water. As we proceeded, we frequently crossed wooden bridges that are removed when the flood season arrives. Further we descended, the narrower the canyon walls were until they were just about 15 across, which we call the Iron Gates or Cider Ports. After leaving the park, the first restaurant we came to was selling fresh squeezed orange juice at a premium price of 450 euros, and most of us gladly paid. We had lunch at the waterfront village of Agia Romelli, where we waited for our ferry that would return us to our buses in Soja.
on the 15th of July, I took a local bus to the nearby port of Suda for my midnight ferry boat ride back to Athens. This nearly empty ferry boat looked like it was primed for party time with lots of cafes and bars, disco club, and a pool, but most were closed because of COVID restrictions and lack of customers. At the Piraeus port, I disembarked from the Keon Palace Ferry, shown with the red band, to the Piraeus Metro. I got off at the Montserrati station and walked the two blocks to the Safe Stay Hostel. I stayed there two nights before heading out by train to Kalambaka and Meteora, some four hours away. I was intrigued to visit this place because since the 11th century, hermit monks had been building their monasteries way up these mountains. In the 14th century, during the Byzantine era, they increased the number and improved their security to protect them from the ongoing bloodshed from the Ottomans. At one time, there were 24 monasteries among these steep mountains, and now there are just six active monasteries and nunneries. Until you see these uplifted mountains, it's hard to believe that monks and nuns lived up there. They used removable ladders to protect themselves, and they also had hooks and nets where they would lift up the monks and supplies with a windlass. On the way to the Mani Agias Triados Monastery, I spotted these two eager turtles. This was a four mile hike with an ascent of over a thousand feet. It took me about three hours to get up to the monastery and just one hour going down. The twisty stairway took me up and into the monastery where the views were stunning. The meaning of meteora is suspended in air or heavens above, lofty or between earth and God. No photos were allowed inside the highly decorated sanctuary, but I did get photos of other icons and religious figures. Here is the windlass, netting, and hook they use to haul up monks and goods. Here is a picture of an old monk preparing to be hauled up. As I returned, black storm clouds were blowing in, which would be the first rains during my travels since Croatia. The hostel owners were disappointed that no rain fell, but in the morning it was a cool 73 degrees, which made it a more comfortable day for my second day of hiking among these pinnacles. I took the local morning bus up to two of the monasteries, Varam and the Great Meteoron Metamorphosis. I spotted the St. Nicolaus Monastery and the Rusinau Nunnery along the way. I crossed a long footbridge to get to the Varam Monastery and then climbed a series of steps to get inside the monastery grounds. Here I was able to get some pictures of the elaborate artwork inside the monastery, except for the sanctuary itself. was then on to the great Meteoron Metamorphosis Monastery, 
but only after passing these vendors selling all kinds of religious knickknacks and offerings. After crossing a short bridge and climbing lots of stairs, including a long tunnel dug out of the rocks and sandstone, I was inside the largest monastery grounds in the area. Here is another windlass used for pulling up people and goods. This monastery also has a religious and history museum that featured many lithographs of war's past, Greece's contribution, and its independence. The artwork on the walls date from after the Byzantine era. I then walked down to the Rusano Monastery, run by nuns. Again, there was a wooden bridge that crossed the chasm to this small monastery. While entering, the nuns pitched purchasing religious trinkets, homemade honey, jams, and syrups in their large gift shop. To a kitchen area, but no photos were allowed of the sanctuary filled with religious paintings and icons. When I finished, I continued down some stairs to the roadway below and found a direct trail to Kastraki that would avoid the many road switchbacks. I had lunch near the Kalambaka town square. My journey took me about 10 miles with a thousand foot descent. I finished off the day by having moussaka as the sun set on the pinnacles. The following day, I had an omelet near the town square just before getting the bus that would take me to Delphi, and maybe the oracle will provide me with a prophecy. I thought I was getting a non-stop bus to another popular tourist area. I was wrong. I changed buses four times with waits of 15 minutes to an hour at each stop. It took six hours to get to Delphi. The small town of New Delphi is perched on the edge of the mountain with some spectacular views of olive orchards flowing down to the Gulf of Corinth and the town of Kira. Found the Epic Rooms Hotel overlooking the valley and most importantly it had AC in this 90 degree plus weather. I started my tour of ancient Delphi just like the pilgrims did. Before entering the sacred place that honored Apollo, they would first purify themselves at the Castilla Springs and then make an offering. They would stop along the sacred way at the Roman market where they would buy or exchange goods and perhaps pick up some items for offerings. The omphalos, meaning navel, symbolized that Delphi was the center of the world. The Athenian treasury has been partially restored, but the other city-state treasuries remain in ruins. At the Rock of the Sibyl, original home of the Oracle, I listened for the Oracle to answer my earlier question, will I continue to travel? And it was, it depends on you. Along the sacred way to the Temple of Apollo, the pilgrims would find various statues honoring past wars and victories, and the other city-state treasuries. The Stoa of the Athenians covered walkway remains are just in front of the polygonal wall. This wall construction is similar to that found in Cusco. The Temple of Apollo is just above the Stoa and is where the Oracle of Delphi relocated from the Rock of the Sibyl. Some of the columns have been restored. After passing the Temple of Apollo, I came to the theater where they held dramas, music, and dance performances. Here is a 1930 picture of a performance of Prometheus by Aeschylus. As late as 2018, they performed the Trojan Women by Euripides. 
It was another 20 minute walk up the sacred way to the stadium where races were held along with other athletic events of the Pythian religious festival, which was second only to the Olympics and occurred every four years. At the bottom of the sanctuary, I passed the Castilla Springs and the gymnasium below was a large area filled with various blocks of stone. I then came to the sanctuary of Athena Prona, which contains two temples honoring Athena and the Tholos Temple, which was built around 380 BC. Archaeologists are not sure of the purpose of the Tholos Temple, which has been partially restored. It may be a tomb or a dining hall. It was then on to the museum where I enjoyed the AC almost as much as the objects there. Many of the statues and objects had been recovered from the ancient Delphi site and were now protected from the elements, and replicas had replaced them. I caught the bus here and it was a twisty mountain road on the way to Athens. I returned to the safe stay hostel to enjoy more tourist sites of Athens before returning home. I always enjoyed dining at one of the Monstaraki Square restaurants because there are always interesting events happening there. I began my walking tour of Athens by passing by Adrian's Arch and the Temple of Olympian Zeus area with lots of reconstruction. I then came to the huge Panathenaic Stadium where the 2004 Olympics were held. At the top of the hour, I watched the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. The change takes about 10 minutes and I sped it up to last just a minute. The clicking of the boots came about when King Otto from Bavaria became ruler. He missed the sounds of horses' hooves, so this sound was created with these guards. This west wall entrance is the only remains of Hadrian's library that was the largest structure. It also held music and lecture rooms, a Roman forum with a pool and courtyard bordered by 100 columns. It is also adjacent to this Roman agora, a marketplace. The Tower of the Winds is at the east side of the agora. Its purpose was to provide a visible sundial and wind vane to the people, a kind of early version of a clock tower. The Theater of Dionysus below the Acropolis had over 17,000 spectators for productions of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes between 342 and 326 BC. The Propylaea, or Grand Entrance, is flanked on the right by the Temple of Athena Nike. Here is the view of the Athena Nike Temple from inside the Acropolis. The Parthenon is the jewel of the Acropolis and is currently under renovation.
These columns are the remains of the pediments or statues. These statues are now on display in the Acropolis Museum. The Erechtheion is dedicated to the goddess Athena, and on the north side there's a structure that's dedicated to Poseidon. The south side has the porch of the Karatids, and the remains of the originals are in the museum. Lots of theories about the meaning of the Karatids, ranging from strong maidens to slaves. The Odeon of Herodis, Atticus, is a Roman theater completed in 161 and renovated in 1950. The Acropolis Museum had built the museum on piers over the uncovered village ruins. They show this video of the excavation of the ruins along with how they constructed the museum over the ruins. The museum sculptures and wall reliefs were moved from the Acropolis to here. Here are the actual five keratides from the Acropolis. One is still in a British museum. I then enjoyed seeing the ancient Agora site with its stoa of Ataolis and the Agora Museum. It contained a replica of the Winged Victory and the head of the founder of history. My brother would like this since he was a retired history chair at Whitworth University. The Temple of Hephaestus was dedicated to the god of metalworking, craftsmanship, and fire. The Urmu walking street goes from Monastaraki Square to Syntagma Square near the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It has high-end stores and much street entertainment. For my last meal in Greece, I ate at this Monastraki Square restaurant while enjoying the protests warming up. Notice how the waiter quickly cleans off the tables by using the plastic tablecloth to take away the dishes. Here are some more of the activities I saw at this vibrant square. this time. Burn hop this time. Right foot, two stop. Left foot, two stop. Fly to the left. Fly to the right. The Athens flea market, filled with all kinds of items, was just off the square. After hours, the flea market becomes a collection of interesting graffiti on the steel shutters they drop for the night. The hostel offered on-site COVID testing for 20 euros for a rapid test or 30 euros for a PCR test. The guy shows up in a motorcycle with the kit and we get the results by 4 p.m. the same day by email. I close out my Greece adventure with this entertainment and a last view of the Acropolis from the hostel rooftop.